I'm going to get into my old RSM 275 Techniques uh, tape deck that I worked on years ago. And I had that slipping belt and I put the, uh, the rosin on there and it's worked fine for years. But it's starting to slip again so I guess this time we're going to actually have to get into it and uh, tear it down and replace it. Now I'm going to shorten this down big time because I actually had to do the job twice as the first belt I put in was a little bit too thick and it caused problems. But we'll cut that out and get right down to the chase. This is my old RSM 275 uh, cassette deck. Techniques, techniques, however you want to pronounce it. Uh, it's a two-head deck. It's uh, It works. It's just that it's got a nasty slipping belt in it again. Uh, it's been a while since I put some, uh, I think I put some rosin on this thing years ago. And it's been working fine, except for lately it has started to stick again. So uh, it sounds like the belt is slipping when I, when I operate it. Man, this thing's heavy for a plastic deck. Um, you know, all the basic functions, fast forward, rewind, except for work, except for play. Unless I do that, then it goes into play. So the belt, you can hear it slipping, but is it the belt that's slipping or is it the, is it the cam is gummed up? Because as they say, all I gotta do is just do that. Tap it on the, tap it on the. It was feared that some kind of international alliance was forming. So we're going to pull this thing apart and see why it's doing that. I know that the belt is slipping. I know that because you can hear the belt slipping. But is it slipping because the cam is sticking or is it slipping just because the belt? But look at all the boards in this thing. It's really, it's really quite the, uh, quite the unit. So this is the, obviously the mechanism. We'll take this uh, top off this mechanism and see if we can see the belts. It's when it uses a direct drive motor. And I've, I've retired this unit pretty much completely now because I'm using the uh, I'm using the JVC for playing back the odd old tape. I used to use this one for playing back tapes on. The only reason I'm hanging on to this thing is because it has DBX. I've got to take the front face off this too to get this top cover off. It's got a couple screws that go in from the front. I believe this front panel has to come off, if I'm not mistaken, to access that. And that means taking the knobs off, at least the record level knob has to come off. Should pop off the front, I think. Come on, there we go. Oh, yeah, I did have to remove those screws after all. Okay, now if I take out these two screws here, this top plate should lift off to reveal the uh, loading belt that's slipping. Okay, this is the mechanism. Which belt is the one that's slipping on this thing? Is it this one down here? Or is it this one over? I think it's this one over here. Yeah, it's this one here. Now, according to... Right. That belt is the one that's slipping. And, uh, as you can see, it's, it's not a pretty one to change. Because the drive motor, I believe it's picking it up off this drive motor over here, if I'm not mistaken. As you can see, when you tap it, in danger of becoming merely a province. Order. As you can see, when I it's the same motor that spins the tape, right? It's the drill drive motor. As you can see, it is... I mean, there is a fair bit of torque on here. So it's... Uh, it could be the mechanism, too. It might be just the... the, the uh, let me just check to see how the... How the uh, 
the sliding mechanism is. It might be just the sliding mechanism for the, uh, the plate that lifts up and down. It might be that that's sticking. We can certainly check that out because I can remove the two screws here that hold the uh, cassette back plate in place and see whether the, uh, the actual mechanism that lifts the head is sticking because when I stop that pulley from turning by hand there is a fair bit of torque on it so it may be this So after inspection I did find that the mechanism itself is fine, it is just the belt that's getting a bit lazy and slipping. So we're going to change out the belt. What I did discover is the first time I took this thing apart it took me a lot longer to do it because I didn't have a clue what had to come apart. So we're going to cut all that part out when I get to the belt and uh, we'll, uh, I'll show you the second time because the second time I did it was much easier since I knew what had to come off. It is a fair bit of work to change this belt, but it is uh, something that is doable. And I think most people, if they've got a deck like this, would be able to change it following these there's directions. Something sticking in here. Like. One thing I'll say is the thickness of the belt is the big factor because I had a belt exactly the same size as the original, but it was slightly stiffer, and that caused a problem. I'll show you what happened. It, it caused it to rewind and fast forward really slow. And I put a, a actually smaller but thinner belt on and it worked like a charm. You can see that this one here had a, there, there was a dual capstan version available. There's the, the die cast chassis for the second capstan. This is a direct drive um, capstan on this direct drive motor on this, which is one of the things I really like about this machine is it's got really low wound flutter because it is a direct drive. And the one I've replaced this with in my studio is that uh, JVC 1010 because it's a dual capstan um, direct drive. And the speed on it is bang on too, just like this one. This is the one I calibrated. This one uses a, um, a servo control motor and I calibrated this thing with a, with a calibration tape years and years ago. And I check it once in a while. I have a 3 kilohertz calibration tape that I, I put on this and check it. And it's always been like, like dead, dead center perfect speed wise there is a little adjustment up here speed control adjustment there we'll check that out on this as well note on this unit a little different design than we're usually uh, seeing on cassette decks most three motor cassette decks will have one motor for the capstan one motor for the real drive and one motor to operate the mechanism to load and unload the heads and, and pinch roller this one's a little different design this is also a three motor design but it has a separate motor, the one at the top of the screen there. That motor is only for playback to drive the take-up hub on playback, and it has its own limiter clutch. The motor in the middle that you see there, that one's used for fast-forward and rewind, as well as operating the mechanism through that clutch that I'm moving with my finger there. So that makes this one kind of a unique design, and, and you don't see this one, this type of design very often. Because most of them, again, have one motor that's dedicated just to operate the cam to, to raise and lower the head. And they use just one motor for the take up and supply spool in rewind, fast forward, and playback. Mechanism comes out by just removing these two screws in the bottom. That way I can lift the entire mechanism out. And one of the nice things about this unit is that the entire cassette transport is all connected by plugs but there are two flex cables that do not detach so you got to be really careful if you're going to take one of these mechanisms apart but let's let's remove the plugs and lift the mechanism out so that i can work on the unit away from the rest of the chassis there's the direct drive motor
I'm just checking now and confirming that everything is operating smooth, so the problem is just a belt that's slipping. We're going to skip ahead here. I've changed the belt. And I didn't even show you guys how I took it all apart. That's because uh, the first time I took this thing apart was uh, trial and error. To figure out what had to come apart. And I ended up taking a lot more things off than I really needed to do. But um, um, in the end, this belt that I put on is no good. And I'm going to have to do it again. So I figured I'll save you guys the, uh, the pain of watching me try to get into this mechanism to figure out what had to come apart and uh, we'll do it again but I just wanted to show this clip here I normally would have cut this part out completely but um, this is what happens on these ones if you don't use the right belt because even though the belt that I put in fit no problem and it looked the same as the original belt it just was a little more stiff and that causes a problem so I want to show you guys what problem it causes and I actually went to a, a, a smaller belt but a thinner belt that be, it just it just because of the the stiffness of the belt that I put in it caused the tape reel motor to behave very erratically on fast forward and rewind so I figured I'd show you this so let me get this thing together I'll show you how uh, how sluggish everything is, and then we'll do the belt completely, and uh, I'll show you how to take this mechanism apart without pulling out all your hair, because uh, there is a procedure to do it. If you have a manual, it's easy, because it'll tell you what screws to take out, but uh, I didn't have a manual. I had to figure it out uh, myself, and uh, I found a real easy way to get in there. So let's show you what it looks like, and then we'll, we'll proceed to change the belt. Uh, that belt I put in was almost identical size, but as you can tell, it's a little bit too tight because it certainly is affecting the speed of the fast forward and rewind. It does go into play. I gotta try another belt. That one was very close, but uh, obviously it's uh, not close enough. I should have gone to a little thinner one, I think. So here, here we go again. Let's see how fast I can do it this time. Now that I know what I got to take apart on this to get at it. Should be able to do this a lot quicker the second time. And hopefully the belt that I find this time will be the one that will be a little more suited to it. I gotta pull this off again. Put that hyper out of place. Okay. Undo the plugs. thing you got to be really careful with on this chassis is these flexible connectors that connect the control board to the mechanism that's that flex connector on the right there by my hand and be very careful because if you tear this little flexible PCB the unit is now history basically unless you can repair it there's another one on this secondary board the B board as they call it which is what takes power down to the three-phase motor, the direct drive motor. And this one here, of course, they, these connectors are soldered on. There's no connector. If they had a plug on there, this would be no trouble. You could just unplug them and 
away you go. But uh, because of the design, you can't. So you have to keep the boards attached, and that means uh, th things can get a little bit uh, awkward to work on because you've got these two circuit boards that are going to hang off of the chassis. So any work you do on it, you're going to have to keep in mind that you got to be careful to not damage the uh, flexible boards. Just removing a couple screws now that hold the tape reel motor in place. There's two screws that need to come out. Actually, that this is actually the detection switches. This one comes out first. And then there's two screws that hold the reel drive motor in place and one screw that holds a solenoid in place for the brakes. And that has to come out as well. So first I'm going to remove the screw for the solenoid. And then the two screws that hold the loading motor in place. Okay, that's got the motor out. Get the belt off. We'll find a belt that's not quite as tight as this one. This is actually a tedious part here because you got to fish the belt out below these two. It's a pendulum gear. There's two gears that rock back and forth, so they, they're not both making contact with the main cam gear. One makes contact when the motor turns one way, the other makes contact when it turns the other way. So there is clearance there, but there's not a lot of space. Now, if I release that solenoid at the bottom, that white, uh, that white stopper that holds the, the, uh, gear, the gear in the neutral position will actually drop down and give me a little more clearance. But uh, I'll do that on when I put the new belt on. But, it's a little bit uh, tedious to get this thing here. And, of course, with the two circuit boards hanging off there, you can't really move this thing much without risking damaging uh, the boards that are hanging off of it. Okay, now I find a different belt. Maybe a little thinner belt this time. I'm going to try this belt here. It's a... It's a thinner belt, so it should uh, flex a little easier than the other one did. We'll just release that catch so that I can slip the belt in and around the gears. That spins freely, freely. Do 
the motor screws back in. Turns nice and freely. Nothing sticking there. Now I just got to get the solenoid back in place. The solenoid fits over a little uh, cog that sticks through from the other side. It's used to uh, release the brakes, or to actually to apply the brakes. I guess it is for when uh, when you hit the stop button to stop the wheels from turning. So. When it's uh, in place properly, the mechanism will move freely. If it sticks, then it's not in place properly. Take it out and uh, realign it. Otherwise, the brakes won't work. Solenoid's nice and free. That's good. That's working good. I'm having better vibes already. Things that just seem to be working a little more smooth now with this different belt, a little thinner belt in. The other one might have been just a little bit too a little bit too thick and it was causing things to stick a bit. Get this wire out of the way. Get the motor board mounted. Oh, yeah, better put the uh, better put this piece back in first easier with the motor board out of the way. The switch board as it's called. I guess I should say the switch block because there's no circuit board here it's just two switches mounted on a metal plate but it's used to detect metal and uh, high bias tapes. That. Now I can put the motor board. And this is what I mean. The second time I took this apart, this time, it came apart and went together very smoothly because I knew what had to come out to get at certain screws. When you first start on something like this, you don't want to take out boards unnecessarily. You try to change belts and stuff without tearing everything down because, of course, when you tear things down, you run the risk that other things are going to get damaged. But ultimately, the only way to do this is to take those boards out. Otherwise, you're going to create yourself a whole big headache like I did the first time I tore it down. And maybe I will publish on my Patreon page. I'll publish the whole video showing them the time I spent trying to get to this belt without taking out the boards. And it was, it, it, it was, a, it was a learning experience. No, the boards have to come out. There's no way around that as there's screws that are in behind them that you can't access without removing it. That's the motor drive I see there, by the way. Connects to the three-phase motor. Insulator back in place. And finally the control board. Control board, I guess. It's got the main control IC on it. Again, plug all the plugs back in.
The N plug is here. The next one is the uh, O plug. So N, M, and then the O is over here. They're all marked. The P plug, the M plug, is this one. And there's a P plug here somewhere, wherever it went. That's the P plug there. It's for the light. It clips in like that. Keeps the wires out of the way. That's moving nicely. We'll put the um, the idler back in place and the cut washer on there. That's good. Okay. I think we're ready to put this thing back into the... Oh, i got to put the front, put the front panel back on. Uh, this thing is locked. Get out of the locket. Just have to turn the cam gear on the side to make sure the heads are in the lowered position. And then the uh, eject button will work to open the uh, compartment. Once again, we'll put the chassis back into uh, the box and plug all the plugs in. Nice thing about this unit, you'll notice that every plug has a letter on it and the connectors are also marked. So there's no mistaking which plugs go where. Plus the fact that they're different sizes anyway, but uh, it makes it really easy when you've got connectors that are all uh, properly labeled uh, some of the brands out there didn't do that and you pretty much had to try to remember where things went But uh, this one here again, everything's all labeled. It makes it real easy to uh, plug things back in where they belong
I got all the plugs in. Again. Buttons in place again properly. Like that. There we go. Okay, power switch is back in place. Power this thing up and see what works. Ah, ah. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. Looks like it's working. Let's uh, put a tape in it. See what it does. Fast forward. Rewind. Play. Yes. Exactly what it's supposed to do. Pause. Record. Stop. I think I can uh, put this thing back together. Let's get the top. Uh, plate on here. So what this plate is for is it's just to support the circuit boards. It fits in kind of like that Clips around that board there. That just it holds the uh, Boards in place so that they don't Get damaged. They don't bump around and it's just held in place by a couple of, of screws Cassette door. There, like that, like new. Let's uh, check the speed on it. Pretty darn close. 440.1, yeah. 440 yeah. That's. Back to 3 kilohertz too. 3 kilohertz. Exactly on frequency. One of the reasons I like this deck is for the noise reduction, of course. But you see, I got a lot of I got a lot of tapes that I made back in like the 1980s. This was recorded November 15th, 1986, and I I did my mixes off of a lot of some of this was off CD, some was off vinyl. I had a DJ set up in my studio. I had. Two turntables, two direct drive turntables. Um, SLM1 was one of them, and I had a Sony, direct drive Sony, with a Q switch on it as well. And I had a couple of CD players. I had a CDP40, and uh, I had a Phelps, but I got rid of it, it broke. I had a CDP40 for the second, and a CDP555ES was the main CD player. And I would just uh, throw a mix together, and I recorded it with DBX because I wanted the best sound quality. So I've got this old tape that's been kicking around here for many years and hasn't been listened to in uh, probably 30 years. I won't be able to play much of this, but uh, we'll play a few seconds of it and uh, we'll play it back. I'll play it without DBX first and then we'll put it on. So here is side one of this tape. Again, I'll have to I'll have to cut it pretty quick here, but we'll hear it without. Uh, without DBX.
So that's without the DVX. We'll put the DVX on. Without it. So, so again. You can see how bad it sounds because it's all compressed. DBX on and it sounds normal. Oh well, yeah, I'll play through one of my mixes here. I'm sure I can get away with this. I guess that's about all I can go. But I mixed tapes like that. I mean, it was always fun. It was fun to mix tapes, spinning records, and uh, CDs. Now, I mean, you can just drag a playlist in and set your jukebox to auto crossfade, and you're good to go. But uh, back in the day when I recorded this, it was all done. You'd sit down for 90 minutes and record a tape. I have hundreds of tapes mixed like this, all mixed together. Maybe not hundreds of tapes, but dozens. No, I probably got close to a hundred. I probably got close to a hundred tapes that I've mixed. Uh, then I went over to DAT and I started doing the same thing on DAT tapes. So I've got probably a hundred mixed DAT tapes that I still listen to. That's the only reason I keep my DAT machines running, really, is so I can play some of my old tapes. And I keep. That's one of the reasons I wanted to keep this one running is because this one in my TX850. They're the only two decks I have that have a DBX. I'm looking at the auto tape select and it's showing this as being a normal tape when in fact it is a chrome tape. So why is the switch not detecting? Do we have another problem on this thing? Hmm. The switch should be detecting the type of tape and it's not. Nothing serious, it was just the wires were too tight. <laughs> okay, I was wondering why is it not detecting the type of tape? that's in it. It's because the wires were too tight. Now it's detecting the type of tape that it is. Yeah. Metal. There we go. It says metal when there's no tape in because that's how it detects. See, if I put a, a chrome tape in now, it lights up chrome. Green. We're going to uh, do a test recording. I think I can record on this tape. This is just one that I've been recording stuff on. Yeah. Or what would then? So I can record on this, so we're gonna do a we're gonna do a recording from my MP3 player. Now on a unit like this you can you can actually set the bias. Um oh I gotta plug it in first of all to my tuner. I've got it plugged into my MP3 player. If plug it into the tuner, we'll set the bias up. How you set up the bias on something like this is you record the white noise from your uh, FM radio with no no station, and you'll you play it back and listen, and try and get the levels and the the, the sound to sound the same. On a two-head deck, it's kind of hit and miss to get the sweet spot. So basically, what I do is I'm going to record some uh, tone, or not tone, but noise, with my bias at uh, set at zero, and I'm going to play it back and I'm going to listen to it and see how it sounds, and then we'll try bias up or bias down a little and see how it affects the sound. So I recorded at zero, I'm getting back a little bit less, getting back at about minus uh, two. So we'll, we'll reduce the bias to number two, like a negative two, and we'll record some more tone or more noise. We'll record this for maybe 10-15 seconds, rewind it, and listen to it. I'm doing it with no noise reduction. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get the levels to come back the same as uh, they were recorded. Okay, now I can go back and we'll listen to that. Okay, we'll try it again. This time I'll take it to, to three. And we'll record it again. Yeah, 
getting back almost what I was getting before. And I'd say with a three head deck, you can do this, adjust it live because you can hear your recording as you're making the recording. You can listen to the playback head. On a two head deck, you pretty much have to fine tune and just experiment a bit and see how things sound. That's a little lower now, so. I think I was pretty happiest was about, about, at about the two on the negative side. So now, let's make a recording. I'm recording with DBX, let's uh, hit it. So I'm going to play this back and we'll play it back right from the uh, tape right into the camera so you guys can hear how it sounds off of tape. It's going to let this track record and then we'll play it back in a minute. While this records, I'll just go over the boards. Uh, this has got separate Dolby boards for the left and the right channel. Uh, I believe this was the, is it the right channel? What's it say here? Uh, left channel. Left channel Dolby board. Right channel Dolby board. This was the DBX board. So you get your voltage controlled attenuator here, your expansion level, and uh, I, I don't want to play around with any, any of these controls because I don't have any way of, of calibrating them. I don't have the equipment required to calibrate um, DBX. You need DBX calibration tapes for one, which I don't have. So I'm not, I won't touch any of the controls on here besides the fact that they should never need to be touched because, you know, Unless somebody monkeys with them, they're never going to go out. And the same with the speed on this. Like, when I checked the speed, the speed was absolutely perfect. Now, this machine has not had the speed checked on it in years. Right? I, I checked the speed when I got this machine. I first checked the speed, and it was, like, it was dead on. All these years later, this thing, the speed is still absolutely perfect. This is the deck that I have been using when people have wanted some calibration tapes, like speed calibration tapes for me. This is the deck that I've been using because it's it's dead on. And that was confirmed when I put it put the uh, speed tape into my JVC when I was testing that. And it was right on as well. So it's, um, yeah, it's very accurate, the speed on this unit. And uh, I trust it because I calibrated it using a factory tape years ago. And I, then I made a tape. The tape that I just put in was one that I made, but I made a tape right after verifying the calibration with a factory tape. I still have a factory tape. I guess just have to go and dig it up, but I could go find my factory three kilohertz tape and put it in here and it would show exactly the same thing because the tape I used to verify this was one I made right after the speed was tested or the speed was, was calibrated. I made a few working tapes that I use. That way if they get chewed up, I'm not losing a you know tape that cost me a couple hundred dollars when I when I bought it initially. Well I didn't buy it, I stole it from the shop that I worked for, but it it walked out of my back pocket when I put my last day there. But uh, anyway, um let's uh, take this one and uh, uh take a listen to the sound right off the playback circuit. Notice no tape hits from DBX, it's wonderful.
Well, that about does it for this RSM275X. That's how to change the control belt that controls the mechanism. I say this is a fantastic sounding tape deck, probably one of the better two-head decks that's ever been made by any company. This was done right at the height of cassette decks, 1984. That was right when cassette decks were right in their prime for the very best decks, to say techniques. Panasonic did a very good job with this one. Pain in the ass to change that belt, but uh, this one's now good for another 30 years. Thanks for watching.